Welcome everyone to a reaction series that many of you have been requesting. This is John Brown by our friends over at Extra History. You know how much I love their stuff and how much I really enjoy how they tell a story. And I typically like to wait till a series is complete by them before I do a reaction to their videos, give it a chance for people to see the originals, make sure that they get all their views and things of that nature. So as their series is winding down, I'm ready to pick it up and start uh, digging into it, breaking it down, giving a little more added context and information. And uh, so I'll begin recording this series here before I go to Tennessee. And by the time I get back and by the time we get through the first four episodes, the fifth episode should be out. So let's go ahead and dive in. The link is in the description. I encourage you to check out Extra History. Please give them a like, subscribe to them, support their channel so that they continue making great original content about uh, our history. Let's dive in. Franklin County, Kansas Territory, May 24th, 1856. In the dead of night, the militiamen enter the house with guns and order three men, James Doyle and his adult sons, William and Drury, to come with them. They reluctantly comply, while Doyle's wife and the boy's mother watches sobbing. The armed men lead the Doyles into the dark and begin to question them. Had they participated in the sacking of the abolitionist town of Lawrence? You see, three days ago, an armed paramilitary force had descended on Lawrence, flying banners reading Southern rights and varying racist phrases. They had smashed the presses of its two abolitionist newspapers and burned down the Free State Hotel. As they were being questioned, the Doyles noticed something. These interrogators were not from the law. Rather, they are the radical abolitionist John Brown and two of his sons. And this is not an arrest. <laughs> John Brown had like 20 kids, okay? He was married twice. Um, a lot of Northeast Ohio roots here. In fact, many of his first children, I think, were born here in Northeast Ohio. His father is buried here. They were neighbors of the Grant family at one time here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so a lot of information here that you can learn about the John Brown family uh, because he had roots here. But yeah, he had like 20 kids and many of them uh, went on to live long, very productive lives. But, um, you know, a lot of people think the John Brown story is all about 1859 and what happens at Harper's Ferry. But uh, it really goes back to several years before that. And as I'm sure we're going to talk more about what is known as Bleeding Kansas uh, it really was a mini civil war, and it was a microcosm of the greater problems that we're going to deal with as a country just a few years down the road. Of course, we don't know exactly how they responded, but at a signal from Brown, broadswords flash in the moonlight. And when the screaming dies down, Brown finishes James Doyle with a pistol shot, and he and his boys depart. They have a busy night ahead of them. There are three more slavers on his list tonight. Thanks so much to Trade Coffee for keeping us history-loving beans well-caffeinated. So before we get into this series, uh, I want to just throw something out there because I don't know exactly what all they're going to cover. I haven't seen any of this yet. But the story of John Brown really poses a, a, a pretty deep philosophical question to all of us. When is violence appropriate? When is violence the answer? At what point do you get that some wrong that is being perpetrated is so egregious that committing violence on the people doing it is an appropriate response? And does that violence include people that are innocent and maybe get caught, caught in the crossfire and are just kind of a byproduct of that you know so you can apply that kind of an idea to things like world war ii when we talk about firebombing tokyo or dresden uh you know is that appropriate in response to things that were done by those nations even if those people who were in those cities weren't directly responsible uh that's one of the questions that, that the actions of john brown is going to raise john brown is one of the most controversial figures in american history a radical abolitionist, he preached that a nonviolent solution to slavery was not possible, that all races were equal under God and the law, and that the only form of emancipation was immediate and total. Now, that's a great distinction he makes there about all races were equal under God and the law, because there were some people, uh, a great example might be someone like Abraham Lincoln, who felt that 
there should be equality under the law, or at least he comes to that decision. Equality under the law, but that inherently there was an inequality between the different races, which is why so many people advocated, for example, resettlement to Africa or to Central America or the Caribbean. Some people were willing to go the step that, yes, legally there should be equality, but in reality, not so much. If that required a violent uprising, then so be it. Now, while we as modern people admire his goals of racial equality and an immediate end to slavery, in the 1850s, these were extreme views, mm. even amongst abolitionists. And Brown's use of violence horrified the largely pacifist anti-slavery movement at the time, at first. He was referred to as insane, as a zealot, and debates continue to this day over whether he was a hero or what we would today call a terrorist. His willingness to act on his principles, to spill white blood to liberate black people, would make him simultaneously one of the most admired and hated men in America. So, interesting, another thing, just to think about, whatever you think about the actions of people that we label as terrorists today, whether they're right or wrong, I'm not here to like try and get into a modern history debate, but it's interesting to note that just like today, there are people who are going to label someone a, a terrorist and other people are going to say that same person that some people label as a terrorist is a holy warrior, is a freedom fighter, is someone who's doing what's right. And people can have two very differing opinions on the same action depending on where you fall on that. And the same thing was true in John Brown's day of him and people like him. Especially after he seized a federal arsenal in an attempt to kickstart and arm a massive slave rebellion. In fact, he's often listed, personally, as lighting the fuse of the Civil War. And if that's true, we know when the match was struck. Ohio, 1812. John Brown has just met a slave owner for the first time, and he likes him. It's a marshal who runs the town where John has just delivered his father's cattle. And at a dinner party, the marshal cannot stop talking about how great he thinks John is. He's amazed that John, only 12, drove his father's cattle here alone. He recounts John's adventures and life of hardship, moving from Connecticut to frontier Ohio, and losing his mother at age 8. So something I want to point out here, because when you think of Ohio, you don't typically think of it being close to slavery. But remember that pretty much half of Ohio's border with other states is a border with slave states. Let me show you what I mean. So here's Ohio, right? And, and you know, if you're looking at the United States at this time in history, 1812, we're basically looking at like right here, right? Because this is the West right here. The, the, the Mississippi River is the West. Um, so here's Ohio. And you think of Ohio being a Northern state, right? Because North of Ohio is Canada. But what's South of Ohio in uh, John Brown's day? Virginia. Right here, all of this is Virginia. This is a slave state in Kentucky. That's a slave state. And John Brown, at this point, is living right in this area around Kent, uh, Akron, that area. You're not that far away. Uh, in fact, let me just kind of show you measure distance. Um, to Virginia, you're 52 miles from slavery. Uh, it's not really all that far. And as the party talks, they're served by the marshal's slave, a boy about John's age. Earlier that evening, the two had played as friends. Now, John is a strict Calvinist, raised in the abolitionist hotbed of Hudson, Ohio. He'd been taught slavery is evil, and he'd seen the escaped slaves his father, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, hid on their farm. But this marshal, he doesn't seem evil. He's so nice. But as the guests leave, the same man who treated John so kindly walks to the fireplace picks up an iron shovel, and begins beating his friend over the head with it for not serving the food fast enough. Wow. That was John Brown's first brush with slavery. Not the kind portrayed in abolitionist pamphlets and speeches, mind you, but real slavery, where you could see the bruises and smell the blood. And when you're 12 years old, that leaves a deep and lasting impression on you, right? I mean, yeah, if you're 25, 30 years old and you witness this for the first time, maybe you see it differently. But that... You can understand that. It horrified him. Truly, he thought, this was a sin against God. And Brown thought about God a lot. He did so while wandering the woods during his off hours after working in his father's tannery. He memorized the Bible cover to cover and could recite any verse perfectly on command. 
However, his dreams of becoming a minister were dashed at the age of 16, when he went east to do preparatory theological studies, but found himself unequal to it. His schooling was poor, and an eye condition made him unable to keep up with the reading. He instead returned to Hudson to start a new tannery, complete with a room for hiding escaped slaves. Hmm. It was a success, though Brown gained a reputation as a bit of an eccentric who would not weigh and sell hides unless they were fully dried, even if the customer wanted them. No customer of mine is paying for water. They brought in a woman to bake bread, and John, though shy, would go on to marry her daughter, Dianthe. They would have seven children together. Now, we have to... So he's married twice. His first wife dies, I think, after like 10, 12 years of marriage. And then he has like 13 more kids after that. Um, and, and that was a pretty common thing back then. If you, if you had a wife that died young, especially if it was childbirth or tuberculosis or some other illness that took a lot of people young, and you were still only in your 30s or 40s, you would, you would marry, if not to have more kids, to have someone to raise the kids you already had with the first wife. Take a moment to talk about what Brown was like as a father, because for him, battling slavery would become a family affair. Hmm. Brown ruled over his family like an Old Testament patriarch. He could be gentle and affectionate, singing his children to sleep and nursing them when they were ill, but even minor infractions in the Brown household were corrected with a switch, despite Brown clearly not enjoying it. And isn't that interesting, given what we've just seen where we saw the slave owner beating someone? I'm not necessarily making an exact equivalence between the two, but I would have thought that maybe that would have scared him off from corporal punishment like that. In fact, once, when his eldest son, John Jr., had accumulated 25 lashes, Brown saw an opportunity for religious education. After giving the teenaged boy eight, he handed Jr. the switch and told him that he would take the other 17, a lesson he hoped in both Jesus taking on the sins of the world and that Jr. hurt his father when hmm. he disobeyed. When he was 25, Brown sold his tannery and relocated the family to Pennsylvania. This was partially because Brown never felt content unless he was building something, but also because the escaped slaves he hid at his farm would be safer. I understand that mindset. My, I was raised by my grandparents. My grandfather, um, for the first 20 years of his adult life, he worked as a construction foreman building homes. And that company he worked for went out of business, and so he went back, got an education, became an electronic technician, and spent the rest of his life doing that. But my entire life, up until when he passed away last year, um, he was always building something. He was always remodeling some room in the house. He was always, you know, renovating or changing something. And it, it was just, it was ingrained into who he was to do that. And we all have those parts of our personalities, don't we? Just things that we are just naturally always going to want to do, whether it's our profession or not. And for John Brown, I think it's been ingrained in him this idea of building something and, and doing something new. And so that's why he's not going to stay in one place and he's always going to look for the next thing. He also probably has a personality that grates on people and he probably wears that as welcome in places. Despite his youth, Brown became a major figure in the community there, founding another tannery, surveying, becoming a postmaster, and helping 2,500 people escape to Canada wow. over the next decade, wow. until misfortune struck. First, his four-year-old son died, followed by Dianthe dying in childbirth, delivering a stillborn daughter. Brown, himself ill and in deep grief, sent his five children to a neighbor as he spent hours each day lying face down on their graves and weeping. Mm. He remarried the next year to the 17-year-old Marianne, daughter of his housekeeper, with whom he'd have 13 more children. Yet Brown's businesses never recovered from his lost year. He moved his family back to Ohio and bought land near a developing canal. Sure, he'd be able to sell it for an enormous profit. However, the Panic of 1837 hmm. wiped him out, and his large number of children ensured he'd never be financially sound again. These are all important parts of the story, and I love that Extra History does this, right? His story doesn't begin in Bleeding Kansas. It doesn't begin in 1859. It doesn't begin with those things. All of this is a part of creating the John Brown that we study in the history books. It all matters. This was yet another confusing period for Brown. He knocked around, working where he could find it, and he fretted that, despite his work on the Underground Railroad, he simply wasn't doing enough to battle slavery. He was ejected from his church for inviting a black family to sit in his pew hmm. and mused over starting a school for African-American youth. 
and Brown's Dark Decade was mirrored nationally in the wider abolitionist movement. So I'm sitting here looking at this and I'm seeing John Brown going about doing the things that everyone else that feels passionately about abolition is doing, right? He's helping with the Underground Railroad, helping escaped slaves get to freedom. He's trying to fight for them to have equality and being in church and getting education and things like that. These are things a lot of abolitionists are doing. But John Brown's personality is such, whether through his experiences in life or just his very nature, that he's not going to be satisfied with that. He's going to want to do more. He's going to see that what they're doing isn't working and something else needs to happen. During the time of Brown's father, it had been assumed that with the importation of slaves banned in 1807, the institution would die out. Instead, it was growing more powerful politically and economically. Slave owners had responded to the tightened supply with livestock-like breeding programs, doubling the enslaved population from 2 million to 4 million. Why? Because if you can't import them anymore, now the ones you have is all that are possible to have. So now you're going to breed them. Now you're going to, and it's terrible to say that. We're talking about them like they're animals, but that's how they were viewed. They were property that could multiply and make you money. Efforts to stop slavery's expansion failed as well. Pro-slavery legislators negotiated the Missouri Compromise of 1820, creating a situation where for every northern free state added to the Union, a southern slave state would be added as well. Slavery advocates also increasingly relied upon violence. In 1835, a pro-slavery mob in Boston crashed a lecture by William Lloyd Garrison, founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society. The 1,500 rioters pulled Garrison through the street by a rope, and only the mayor's intervention prevented his lynching. So violence is a common part of all of this on both sides. It's not unique to one side or the other. Another blow came in 1837, when an armed mob besieged minister and abolitionist newspaper editor Elijah P. Lovejoy in the warehouse that he'd used to hide his printing press. Lovejoy was shot five times and had to be buried in an unmarked grave to prevent desecration. Mm. Memorial services were held across the nation, and in Springfield, Massachusetts, a strange thing happened. At the end of the service, as the last hymn reverberated, a man stepped from the back of the church and raised his right hand. He was new in town, a wool specialist, I think, but he'd already made an impression. Here by God, the man said, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. Mm. It was John Brown, and he had found his mission. A mission he was in exactly the right place to pursue since he had moved to Springfield in order to make the connections that would help him strike a death blow to slavery. Connections that would put him in contact with Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and the Secret Six, the abolitionist financiers who discreetly funded his guerrilla war. The path to bloody Kansas was laid, and John Brown would follow it. All right. Fascinating start. I'm really interested to get into more of his story. I know some of it just because of my study of the American Civil War. But uh, if you have something to add to the conversation, use the comment section below. Let's keep it civil. This is not a place to belittle or uh, attack other people. Let's have a conversation about this stuff. Uh, it, is the way he chose to do this appropriate? And is it okay if that involves hurting innocent people? Uh, who might you know, be children of slave owners, for example. So these are all things we have to consider when evaluating this guy, John Brown. Be back tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.